And welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where we are connecting Kill Team communities around the globe. This week, we're zooming in on the Nova tournament scene, which is coming up soon. We've got a special guest today, Matt, who runs Nova for the Kill Team stuff. Hello. Welcome. Travis, regular scheduled co-host. You know, Matt's been a veteran of the 40K hobby. He's been talking about it for a long time, playing it for a long time, it sounds like, when we did our pre-show meetup. And I met you at the first Kill Team Open, right? Where you're playing Warp Coven? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you had one of the cooler display boards of that weekend. Thanks. And yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you about your special teams, the Higher Tech Circle and the Chaos Cults. Sounds great. Higher Tech Circle is a spicy one. We're, we'll be digging into Nova. Hopefully we'll give you a little bit of time to talk about the, why people should be coming to Nova. They should be coming out to you coming out to listeners the Monday before Nova. So hopefully if anyone's on the fence and you want to swing by, Nova is a convention, so it you don't even have to play to get some value out of Nova, right? No, I, it's amazing. Like, not only do they have basically every game system just about available to play, but there's just tons of seminars and painting classes, and we got GW people there teaching stuff. It's actually a fantastic convention. Yeah, there's even a little bit of a Nova teaser, right? From GW specifically? Yeah, they're going to have a, a release teaser. Sadly, no Kill Team at, on it, but just about everything else is going to be on it. Yeah, unfortunately for us. I think I do think that like right now the game feels like it's in a pretty good spot, so I don't need a teaser. I just want the games to be good. But a little bit about not quite the video game. You know, What have you guys been up to in your lives? Getting ready for Nova. <laughs> a lot of painting and building terrain and stuff like that. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a lot. So, like, when it comes to the sourcing of the terrain, um, did, like, are you using GW terrain? Are you using, like, some MDF terrain? So, uh, massive shout-out to GW, but they're giving us, they're lending us their terrain that they've been using for their GTs. Ah, nice. Um, which is absolutely critical, because there's no way I have the budget for that much terrain. <laughs> Yeah. How many people are signed up for Nova's uh, Kill Team tournament? We and are, I guess the external, because there's also pod days and like more casual days, right? So like, how many people are you expecting to have play Kill Team over the course of the weekend? So we have our biggest year ever for the GT at 72. Uh, last year we were at 42, so a really big jump. Um, originally I had it at 64, but it sold out and we had a good wait list. So I was able to talk to the Nova runners uh, and we were able to add eight more spots. Um, then we had the, the team tournament on Friday, which again, went from 12 players last year to 39 this year. Um, so again, another tremendous leap. Um, and then this year we actually aren't doing the casual pods, um, because on the surveys that Nova does, um, people really wanted to see a narrative event. So for the first time, pretty much ever at Nova, we're doing a narrative event with about 35 players signed up for that. Cool. Cool. Are you also doing the narrative? I'm running. Yeah. All four days of kill team. Oh man. That yeah. is, that sounds like a lot on your plate, Matt. Speaking of someone who's done a little bit of everything at this point. It has been, uh, but you know, uh, especially because the narrative is actually, I'm doing a kind of departure from other narrative events. It's not really a tournament. Um, it's more of a um, casual story-based uh, scenarios because we're also working with the narrative event from 40K, um, which has been doing that for years. Uh, so basically, the your kill teams are doing operations that are going to be aiding the larger 40K bat battles, kind of from a fluff-wise, the way it kind of should be. Sounds very, very, very fun. Any Small teasers you want to give for anyone who might be swinging by for the narrative? Uh, yeah, I um, one of the maps that I'm hopefully people really enjoy is it's the top of an Imperator Titan, uh, and I've 3D printed all the buildings and stuff for that. Yeah, that's sick. Uh, if you have pictures of that, we definitely got to get those out because that sounds amazing. 
yeah if you have any pictures we can use those for our um you know our little social media post for it so if you've got a nice picture of something you want to put up for the narrative spread on nova let us have it and we'll uh, get get it up there thank you yeah that'd be great everything else going pretty well in our local scenes our local tournaments players excited for the balance patch i know i am like i was actually getting really down on the on the game before that came out i feel really good about the balance changes too yeah i think goonhammer this weekend everyone seemed to be having fun to be fair there were six commando players which was which was cool um it was fun watching some of the newer commando players who had never played against intercessors and legionary learn the fear of legionary and space marines in that matchup but ultimately the commandos took first and third and then i think second place I don't even remember. I think Leander got second, so he was on Star Striders. So he came back from um, a loss against a Space Room player on day one to get second place after beating a Breachers player in round five. Pretty cool result. Yeah. yeah. It does seem like Commandos are kind of taken over a little bit, at least uh, in the tournaments that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, they definitely got a nice boost, but like I think they're not overpowered. And I think the meta is in a really good place where I think you have a lot of wide open fields. Yeah. I mean, my opinion is that commandos are a really, really strong knowledge check. And the more people get experience against them, the easier it, the matchup becomes. Unfortunately, the triple or double sneaky get plays can feel very oppressive to, you know, like mid skill players who are trying to figure out like, Oh, what do I do in those situations? Do you have any advice for them, Matt? Uh, figure out which guy's the biggest threat, I guess. Like, um, you know, I know usually they put the um, Breacher with a Choppa because his melee weapon's rubbish um, for like a turn one charge and maybe even a stick of dynamite in there. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a tough one. Sometimes you just have to take the loss. Um, I know that's harder for elite teams. I, I honestly play mostly Horde to uh, mid teams. So I kind of have a team that could take that loss. Um, and I know that's a lot harder if you're playing, you know, like a six man team, but um, you just I think it's just about figuring out what the biggest threat is to your team and eating kind of one or the other two guys or whatever they're going to do. Yeah, just like setting your expectations right is a big, important thing where like if just knowing that you're going to eat it is is like true and just like stay cool stay on track and just realize that that's not the end of the game and pre-space don't get dynamited on four guys you know <laughs> if you're worried about the dynamite just space out your guys in advance right you'd much rather one guy get deleted than six guys or four guys or even two guys on an elite team like getting cover is important but not losing the game on one activation is probably a little bit more important and sometimes the commando players will telegraph what they're doing right so like if you know that dynamite guy is on a conceal. Well, either he's going to do an infiltrate in the scout phase or he's not going to use them in the first turn. Um, so you can kind of hedge your plans a little bit to figure that out. Yeah, I think I, ha I remember talking to a player this weekend at uh, the Goonhammer Open. He mentioned that he went to do scouting and he revealed the wrong option and it was too late because once, once you've made that mistake, there's no rolling that one back. Yeah. But I think this week we're going to have a more fun operative showdown, right, Jason? Oh, yeah. Operative showdown. The operative showdown this week is definitely a spicy one. We're going to be ch talking about the Cryptex. There's the Chronomancer, the Psychomancer, and the Technomancer. So we've got a three-way operative show showdown here, just kind of chatting about the pros and cons, when to use them. Are any of them just like a must-play go-to, or any of them like just voted off the island? What's the take? Um, so I've been playing um, the Heretech Circle locally, um, and they are definitely a more taxing team, but I think they're one of the ones with the higher learning curve where if you can learn them, you'll be really good with them. Um, when I started playing, I was playing a lot with the Techo Technomancer just because his ability to heal and the bonuses to um, reanimation and living metal means like you have guys come back near full health. Uh, but honestly, lately I've been leaning more on the Chronomancer just because his ability to speed up your guys and slow down your other guys has just been fantastic. Uh, I still have to remember that he's just trash in combat and not to put him in combat. Um, but he's been my workhorse lately. I honestly haven't had much experience with the Psychomancer. 
just because I feel like his stuff is a little bit more um, finessey and situational. Yeah, I think we've seen people talk a lot about the Chronomancer's kind of like Oppenheimer nuclear bomb play yeah. on turn one. I'm sure, how do you get value out of that? Or do you want to talk about how to set that up for you know listeners who don't know anything about Hero Tech Circle? Sure, I mean, the big thing what you want to do is get a big group of, get an alpha strike with that blast of his. Um, how you pull it off, there's a lot of different ways. He can uh, steal a APL from someone else. He can buff himself um, uh, with his, what was it, the, the chromaton and give himself an extra three inches of movement. Um, he can do both. He's just, the, the amount of actions you can get out of him is kind of sick. And then there, his ranged weapon is a blast two lethal five up stun. The damage is only three three, but I mean, you really don't care about that. What you're really just trying to do is just stun a large group of guys. I did that to a friend of mine the other night. I was able to get him up on a vantage point, and he just nuked like five guys. Didn't do much damage, but they were all stunned, every one of them, because it's five shots. So you're gonna statistically, you'll get a five up in there someplace. Yeah, I think with lethal five, you're basically guaranteed to stun. And then you leech power from a friendly to get yourself to four APL. You fly with effectively like 50 or you're a six inch move. You add three inches because of your chron chronometron and then you take a dash. So now you've moved 12 inches with fly. And that means that on open, you're generally going to be able to get a line somewhere barring an open deployment with mostly all heavy cover. Yeah, we were we were actually playing on um, Chalnith, which is all heavy cover, oh. and even then, I was able to get a guy who wasn't quite behind cover or obscured, and I was still able to blast them all. Yeah, I think with a dash, you can cover. I think on the long deployment edges, you can basically almost make it to the other side of the board. Yeah, it's crazy. When then, you're running, um, I'm just curious. As a TO, do you try to take? Uh, things like the Oppenheimer nuke into play when you're designing boards? Um, yes and no. I mean, board design is so tough. Uh, it's why, honestly, last year for Nova, we did player place terrain. Mm -hmm. um, but we are switching to preset terrain this year. Um, it's so hard to, because every team is so different. Like, there's so many different strengths and they can do so many crazy stuff. Like, you know, the Chronomancer nuke or, you know, co Commandos is a different, completely different way of sneaking up and getting an alpha strike. Um, I just really try to make it so everyone has a significant amount of heavy on their deployment line, or at least one or two pieces, where a good portion of your army is going to be safe. But not everybody. There's, there's just no way of designing a board where everyone's safe on deployment. TSC. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the Chrono, the Psycho, and the Techno, it does it does seem like that's the pattern that I've heard, that Technomancers, before all of the changes to reanimation protocol, where you were resurrecting at, you know, one to three wounds, then the injury removal and the heal were more, more powerful. And now that, you know, the shackles are unleashed on Hero Tech Circle, you guys have been allowed to do more fancy plays with your Cryptek and be a little bit riskier, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and it's been it's been great, and all the free actions everywhere is fantastic. Like, yeah, I it sounds like then you've never really used the entropic lance, or was there a time period where you were using the you know light plasma rifle? Yeah, I've never used it to be honest with. I like I I just think that blast is just so vicious um, that I, I think it's hard to pass that up for the lance. Where yeah, I mean it's good you'll kill somebody probably, but um, it's not a guarantee because it's you know, it's less shots, and it you're still only on three. Yeah. When it comes to, are there any other um, strategies you've seen? You have you've never used a psychomancer then? I haven't. All right, all right. That's I got well, I got to you know. play. I got I got to start at least try him a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got, for anyone who doesn't know, he's the five attacks on threes, two, two, AP two, blast two, splash one. So effectively like two, three splash. So he like scares people with the AP two, which is kind of neat. Not as cool as maybe five attacks on threes, three, three, blast two, lethal five stun, like the Chronomancer, which is much, much scarier as far as damage goes. 
Yeah. Do you sure. feel like maybe the Psychomancer needs a little bit of a boost, or do you feel like he's actually well balanced and you just haven't found a matchup where you want to play him? I think he's pretty well balanced. I think, and to be honest, I think there's a little bit of an owner overtune to the Chronomancer. Um and being able to just, just so many actions. And then like being able to activate some dude next to him to overwatch for free. So like another tactic that you can do that I've done is you deep strike a um, death mark where you think you're going to put your chron- chronomancer and then put him on engage, beeline the chronomancer up, drop the nuke, and then activate the death mark for free, who's now hitting on threes, which is still pretty good for him, to finish someone off who's a threat to the chronomancer at that point. And of course, you got to remember at that point, the chronomancer's got a five up feel, no pain. Yeah, so, five up feel no pain, three up save, thirteen wounds. So he's he's defending like he's got like nineteen wounds almost. I mean, you're gonna give him the four up invol too. So like it's gonna take a lot to remove him, especially if he just stunned a whole bunch of guys and a death mark bodyguard who ju- who's gonna clean up someone else. Yeah, that does sound very, very hard to beat. Yeah. It, it's really, really good. Um, which is why I think the other guys suffer a little bit because he's just such a good choice so when it comes to the apprentic how do you feel about the current state of the apprentic any cool combos or does he still sitting on the sidelines no i like using him all the like he's just great to do other stuff like you know he's the one who can who, who you might use to slap uh chronomatron on the um chronomancer or he might or i use him to slap it on someone else or I'll do the conduit for the extra reroll on there. There's a lot of cool stuff he can do. Um, so no, I think he's great. Yeah, I usually do keep him towards the back. He's supporting the troops and um, you know capturing objectives and doing stuff like that. But I mean, I think he's in a good spot. I mean, I don't think you want to. I think powering up too much would would definitely probably tip the scales a little bit too far, especially because you're you're a team where everyone's got an AP one weapon. Yeah, they're shooting. The shooting on higher tech circle is still kind of kind of insane when you compare it to most teams. Oh, it's yeah. just you know you don't have that many activations. So, right. do have you found the same issue of getting doinked by the reanimation protocol rolls? Yes, <laughs> I, I I I hate the reanimation rolls. I I generally hate RNG in this game. Period. Um, I would have. I wish when they had given us more wounds and reanimation, they didn't do that. And just make reanimation automatic. Say, this guy's definitely going to come back next turn. Uh, especially because they don't come back until the beginning of the next turn. Um, and, you know, so it's not like they're capturing objectives from people or screwing things up like that. Um, I think it should be an auto. Yeah, I think there maybe could be some fun play and maybe giving them fewer wounds overall, but then letting the reanimation be automatic. Right. Just to give you a little bit, just a little bit of something somewhere or the other. But it doesn't seem like a, and win rate that the Heretic Circle is going to be see, touched anytime soon. I think their win rate's been pretty stable, right? Since yeah, the I, massive I think, changes. I definitely think they're in a very good place. Um, like I said, I think they're definitely harder for newer players, but after you get used to them and start figuring out all those crazy combos, because there's just so many of them, um, I think they're very, very good. I guess as a former Warp Coven player, you know, just one set of three actions is really not that hard for you, right, Matt? Right. Yeah, no joke. Like, it's actually less of a brain drain than Warp Coven is. Yeah. I mean, the do you have a display board for your Heretic Circle too? Uh, not yet, because I haven't taken them anywhere competitively yet, so I haven't built, I built one for them yet. They're more, they're more the for fun side at the moment, huh? Yeah, they are. I guess we'll have to talk about Chaos Cults, and we'll. Uh, do you have a board for your Chaos Cults? I do have a board for my Chaos Cults. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Just because I was playing, uh, it was. It's mostly my my board from last edition because that's when I started playing Chaos Cults. They were my first team last edition. Ah, interesting. That'll be that'll be a nice segue later. Uh, as far as your. You've been around the block as far as building communities and seeing the communities that 40K has or has not had over long periods of time. We're wondering for, you know, we have a fair number of people who kind of help their other communities. Obviously, a lot of our podcast guests have been community people. Do you have any like core lessons that you've seen over the lifespan of this game since you've been playing since like third edition, right? Um, That you want to share that like, you know, things to talk about, basically, that help 
keep the community strong because that's really why we're all here i think yeah uh it's gonna be hard at times sometimes all the time (laughs) um you just got to kind of keep going it's always helpful to have a good core of one or two people um who will come out and and you can play a game with uh nothing's more discouraging than showing up for a game night and no one's there um i will say i'm so old um social media has been that uh, you know, using like Facebook and like Discord and stuff to organize game nights and groups. Um, back back in my day, um, we didn't have that. It was kind of just more word of mouth. Um, definitely try to have a normal, regular game night, uh, even if it's you know once a month or twice a month. It doesn't have to be every every week. Um, stuff like that's helpful. And then you know, try to do events. Like it doesn't even have to be a tournament. You could do you know learn to play events if you have a, a relatively newer community. And then when people start getting ready, do a tournament. Um, but it's work and you got to kind of have, you got to stick to it. Like, like my current group is very small. There's only a handful of us and a lot of people have drifted in and out. But um, having a core of people who are interested in the game is definitely helpful. Yeah, a lot of that is definitely some recurring themes there with like the study game nights and like, yeah, that's definitely solid advice. Um, I'm curious if there is anything that you've seen as like landmines and things to watch out for community killers yeah don't don't bring your best list to game night nothing stops a new player more than getting rumple stomped by like void dancers or something like that definitely bring softer lists ones that are less complicated to i think generally help people but yeah i think not that's the biggest landmine and honestly as a competitive player that was something that i had to work on too because you you know, as a competitive player, you will go to your game night because you're trying to test out your teams and trying to get practice and get those reps in for those big GTs. But crushing a, a new guy will is the surest way to make sure they'll never come back. Yeah, I've done that. I mean, I've, I'm guilty of that. I did that at an event where, right, I think right before the first Kill Team Open, I was trying to learn how to play Pathfinders. Wormblade had just been released. And I told my friend that I was going to teach him how to play, and he brought his Wormblade. And I didn't realize it at the time, but Pathfinders just take a dump on Wormblade because they have a bunch of cover rules. You can remove those. They have lots of sneaky things. You remove cover. And I was just like, I think after like two turns, he had like three models. He was like, I don't want to play anymore. I was like, ooh. And then like the story comes up every now and then. And he's like, you just destroyed my soul. And I was like, "Ah, I didn't realize it at the time. I was too, I was like in very much like the competitive like i just want to know how good this team is and i didn't see it and that definitely did hurt i don't think he played kill team again until maybe like six months later when geller pox came out yeah and, and usually those are the guys who like picked a team because it looked cool and they put it together and it looks great painted and they're just really happy about the team and then to get it like dumpster fired is, is just heartbreaking i think that kills people's will to play so hard Yeah, I think being a soft landing pad has been a really, really big change that I've made over a long period of time is to really focus in on how can I make sure that people are having fun first and then deal with the competitive stuff later. Right. I don't know if that's been an experience for your side, Jason. Yeah, definitely 100% the same thing. Um, I, whenever I do, whenever I teach new players, I, you know, it's, it's easy to give the new players some intercessors and then just play some goofy compendium team. And uh, just, like, I'll dangle models out there just to try to, like, show off how different things work. And, like, this shot is legal, this shot is not. Here's why. Yeah. Do you have any, um, because our games are so complicated, do you have any common points that are useful for teaching newer players? Like, when approaching, like, oh, how do I teach a complicated game? Because you've done it, I, I assume, for a couple different editions. Were there any things that you've stuck by and used over a long period of time because you found success with it? Yeah, um... Don't be afraid to not use all the rules. I know that's that's also hard for me sometimes. Um, but you know, like in this edition, get rid of get rid of all the ploys for someone's first game. Um, you know, don't overwhelm them. Um, kind of stuff like that, and definitely be there to help them. Be like, you know, hey, don't forget you. And you know, maybe even not even do a real mission. Just throw some models around and and just kill each other, and just so they can start learning the rules, learning how guys move. Um, you know, explain to them how the kind of like the orders work and why they want to do it at certain times and be like, you know, if you put your guy on conceal, he won't be able to shoot, but he also can't get shot. Um, 
kind of things like that, just really, really helping the person. Like, even if you're playing against yourself, just really coach them through stuff. Yeah, I think there's even like there's like an even more back to basics version of kill team now that we can do where you start on just in the dark because there is no vantage. And then once they've graduated from like, OK, I understand how the vision rules work here. You like then size up to like, OK, now we're going to play with the ability to get shot when you're in cover and then just like blow their mind. Right. Yeah. Or do something like uh, like that with like all the doors open without the door rules, something like that. But yeah, I usually um I'll play on open, but yeah, I'll do some. I'll set something up with no with no vantage. That makes sense. Yeah, I think vantage is definitely one of the more feels bad for a lot of players. I always hear players talking about like, oh, I really don't like thinking about vantage. I'm like, at, from the competitive side, I'm like, that's almost the entire point. The, but from like, uh, I just want to have fun side. I can see how putting yourself into a position and then someone finding a bead on you can can be very frustrating. Yeah, non reciprocal shooting is also really frustrating. I think. Yeah. Do you have any do you think that things like non reciprocal shooting actually hurt the scene or do you like the fact that the game has those kinds of complicated vision rules baked in? Yeah, I go back and forth on that for sure. Like um the pers- the the fair play side of me says get rid of non reciprocal shooting. If you can shoot me, I should be able to shoot you kind of thing. But from the competitive side, it is something, it, it does add a level of complexity and a level, level for expert and veteran players to kind of use against each other um, and something you kind of have to watch out for. Have you ever had um, ser- situations around cheating show up or maybe not cheating, but maybe fuzzy intent or people who just kind of are pushy? Do you have any standard ways of managing those kinds of things? I know with Nova coming out, it's probably something that you're going to have to think about. So have you put any thought into it? Yeah, I mean, stuff like that's always so hard, right? Because I think a lot of that behind is intent. Um, So if someone's intent isn't to be cheating, but they are maybe pushy or very slow playing stuff, those are people, those are usually a little bit easier because I can take those people aside and be like, hey, you know, you need to speed up your game or you need to, you know, take a deep breath and relax a little bit. Um, Kind of things like that. Those are easy. The cheating is always the hardest because, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to call someone out and be like, we caught you cheating, you're gone. And that's, you know, definitely not an experience anybody wants, um, but sometimes you just kind of have to do it. Um, But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give people warnings. I'll yellow card people. Um, and things like that just to, I mean, cause at the end of the day, the game's supposed to be fun for everybody, you know? Um, and if you have one person kind of behaving in, in a way like that, I think it really ruins the fun for everyone. Cause not only is it, and I mean, we've all been there at a tournament, like you're playing, you're playing this guy, you know, you see this guy and he's been at other tables and you're talking with your friends about him. And now you're stressed about if you're going to play him. Um, and I just, I just think that, just really brings down the entire atmosphere of an event. Yeah. Famously, one of the guys on my team, he always manages to play some of the spicier players of a tournament. And we're always, we always laugh at how cursed his tournament runs are. Cause he inevitably plays the person that everyone is like afraid of playing because he's either a little bit too pushy. Maybe he doesn't really care what his opponents are doing. So he is just like not the nicest to play. And that can always be a downer. And I think for anyone who is listening who can be really competitive, it's always good to remember that it's a game first. You're there to have fun. And winning is, while it is important and we enjoy the feeling of winning, it's not the entire point of playing these games. Yeah, and like if you do push it too hard and then you you are burning bridges, it's like it's not fun for anyone. So keep the game fun. Play a nice, clean, fair game. And then you're going to have a lot more fun in the long run, making friends along the way. Yeah. I mean, you know, part of the reason why we have this podcast is and Matt is on this podcast is because I met him at Kill Team Open a couple years ago. I was like, yeah, let's come on. Talk about Nova. We, we like tournaments. Me and Jason have been running tournaments. I just ran Goonhammer and, you know, no cheating as far as I could tell. But we did have a player who got a little bit spicy and quit one of his games because he didn't want to argue about intent. And that's always a fuzzy area for me. Do you, how do you guys manage intent in your scene, Matt? Um, I'll always walk through with the other player what my intent is. So if it's, you know, like like a perfect case is non-reciprocal shooting, right? It's like, okay, I'm, I'm moving. I want to move this guy to a place where I can shoot you, but you can't shoot me back. 
And sometimes it takes a little working back and forth with the other player, but most players um, will always work with you. And it's always good to tell them the, the, your intent. Like, oh, my intent here is to be blocking this this doorway from your guy where you can't walk through or, or the terrain is such a way that you can't fit through. Take a look. Do you agree with that? Um, and they'll be like, no, I don't, or yes, I do. And that always speeds things up, um, I find. And then you don't have that, you know, issue where like, oh, I didn't realize I couldn't do that, or I thought this guy was here. Um, and it just makes it for a much more pleasant experience. Yeah, it's good to remember that a little bit of conversation goes a long way when it comes to maintaining board states in a game like this, because it's so easy for things to fall out of alignment or for you to miss something. So if you're dead silent, it can give you an edge in some cases, but it can also hurt you when it comes to stuff like public intent. Yeah. I think there's, I've seen it a couple times where someone will say they have an intention to do something and, you know, line it up. And then if you actually look at it, it's not there. So one thing I always want to remind people of is to make sure you demonstrate like the physical requirements of the intent. I think Matt, you were saying that sometimes you want to make sure that doors are blocked. It's like, all right, cool. My base is big enough where I stand right in the middle. You can't pass by on either side. And then both players confirm it so that that conversation can go a long, long way to just making sure that everybody can play the same game rather than an asymmetric board game. Sure. Yeah. And, and same thing with like, you know, I'm not a, um, I'm not a chess, pl- ch- chess piece player where, you know, if someone moves their guy and then goes to shoot only to discover, well, I can't, they can't make the shot they wanted. I will always be like, you had the movement position and where you think he wanted to go. Um, kind of little things like that. My general rule of thumb is if it doesn't change the board state and someone forgot something, especially like a rule, because there's just so many rules to this game, um, I'll generally be like, yeah, go ahead and do, and do what you wanted to do. Um, if we have a kind of, if the game's kind of progressed to a point where do the board states change too much, then I can, then I'm usually like, look, I'm sorry. I just don't want you to re, you know, you can't take that back kind of thing. Yeah, I think one thing that I've, I've come to terms with is at the beginning of the game, be more verbose. And then towards the end of the game or like the middle half of the game, after all of your rules have been explained once, it's kind of up to your opponent to ask you when they are unsure about something. If you've explained everything once or twice, I don't think it should be on you to explain every single gotcha every time. But the first time a gotcha comes out, if you do no work explaining it, it does feel a little bit, a little bit cheesy. And I kind I agree with you that the, I'm not really a chess piece kind of player. It's if you touch a piece, and it doesn't work, you can always go back as long as we remember more or less exactly where your piece is or you're willing to take your piece to like maybe a less advantageous position than where you started just because you messed up the movement. Right. Yeah. Well, like obviously, like if you move a guy someplace and shoot with them and then I move a guy someplace else and I'm like, oh, I have a shot on him now. I'm not going to let you take that back. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, no. Once, you know? once dice are rolled, I think we're I think all yeah. three of us are probably agreed that once the dice are rolled, that's that's fixed. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, one thing to watch out for is, like, I've seen stuff happen where if someone moves someone and is going to go for a shot, and then they're like, oh, actually, I should have moved an extra inch to hit the objective marker. If it's if it's questionable that you could reach it, I think that you can't really take that one back once you've moved the model and then you're not sure if you could have reached it ahead of time and then saying, oh, yeah, I definitely could have made that. Because like there's no there's no evidence, and you might just be like stealing an inch for a point swing that is just feels bad and unfair and unfun. So that's kind of one of the the placement like model movement things that I think is fine to enforce like no take backs. But you know like if uh, if you on the other hand if you say ahead of time I'm gonna run over here and grab the objective and then shoot at this guy and then you move them and it's like you or you measured ahead of time you know you can make the movement and when you actually move the model you forget that you're gonna do the objective and then take the shot and you're like oh wait I was gonna do that like that's another part of the like public intent and you said what you were gonna do and you measured it and you both agreed and then that one feels like a fair take back in my opinion yeah I definitely agree with that and if you wanted to keep your intent public and have everybody on the same uh, group chat, you can always join our Discord at Just Another Kill Team Discord. That is absolutely true. The link to that will be in the podcast description. On that note, we're going to change gears here again, and we're going to move into 
the the next section here, which is niche tactics. Niche tactics. And this is going to be niche tactics about chaos cults, especially in this post nerf world. I know that uh, chaos cults have obviously fallen a little bit since their first release, but it, I'm pretty sure they're still pretty good on open. They just take a little bit more work. Have you had any plays that used to work that don't work now, or plays that you've gotten opened up now that the team is a little bit less obvious to play? Um, yeah, I mean, the biggest one is just driving your banner up the center of the field and having that uh, ever-present buffs going off. Um, you actually have to be kind of reasonable about it. Um, but honestly, like, not a lot has not a lot has really changed with how that team plays. Um, they're just not so um, like overbearing like they were. Whereas I, as a Colts player, I was really happy with the changes because I was definitely feeling like I can't play this team anymore. Like they're just no fun for anyone else. I can't play them. But I think the the changes have just really doesn't have haven't really changed much how they play. Just they're just not so much as good as good as they were before at it. Yeah, I think that's a good analysis. It's, it like it keeps the same tone and it just tones down the feels bad a little bit. Yeah, like like the only the only play that 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 is a little bit harder, but even not that much was um you know, driving a mutant into a charge to just um tie someone up so he can mutate next turn into a um a torment. Now where before you like well I can fight in combat. I know I'm going to get, you know, a lot of hits. Where now it's not 100% guaranteed, um, but it's still pretty darn strong there. Yeah, Ceaseless from Relentless does bring the overall power level quite a bit down on the mutants. Does the Demagogue's um, dash charge provide you more power now, or do you find that you're just not using that ability at all? Um, I use it, and I mean, it works. I mean, I think it's just as good as it was before. Yeah, like... Um, I mean, part of the problem with the demagogue is you're usually keeping him in the back because uh, he's mutating guys. And you don't really want to get him killed. Um, but yeah, I use the, the dash is fantastic. I've always used that, um, you know, because it's like now your guy is moving, you know, pregame dash and a game dash and then his two activations. Yeah. Have you oh. felt the loss of the injury bubble at all on the team? N- not really. Um, I admittedly was always pretty bad about placement of my banner. Um, you know, it, it's going to hurt a little bit, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think it was definitely a, a, a good change. I mean, especially because it was still a minimum of, it was minimum of three, right? Is that what the FAQ brought it down to? The icon arc is down to, I think it's still four inch bubble on both sides. The no, injury no. bubble, the injury bubble got turned into two inches around your mutants and your torments oh is that oh that is that the one you're talking about i'm sorry correct yeah yeah, yeah. the oh. the sickening aura yeah sickening aura for you know for players who haven't played against it which i'm sure for competitive players everyone's seen it at this point but it's just the worst in ballistic skill and weapon skill of all enemy operatives around the mutants and torments and that was a big part of why this team felt very very powerful against all the elites initially because even your mutants could reliably threaten a Assault Intercessor, just because you could almost guarantee like three, four hits. Right. Yeah. I mean, I haven't felt it on the demigod. Like, I haven't felt it there. I. I mean, it, the biggest impact is gonna be on the blade guard. Um, mm-hmm. The know, blessed they, blades. Yeah, I'm sorry. The blessed blades. Um, they're the ones who really have lost it. Who were really up there fighting. Um, because I mean, your um, the psyker wasn't fighting. Your banner probably wasn't fighting. Maybe your leader was, but not normally. Um, and that is a slight hit. Um, but again, like I, it's just one of those things where the, the guys that you really hit, which is the torments who are really going to be in the combat, um, still have it. So it's like we were saying, like they still do the same thing. It's just not as oppressive. Yeah. Have you felt the, you, I'm sure the six up feel no pain has hurt a little bit more on the torments what yeah. ways have you adjusted your play? have you pl- adjusted your play style at all actually around the six up feel no pain um not really um i hate feel no pains in general as a game mechanic um just because they're so darn swingy um and so now i kind of where a five up <clears throat> is like 
it's either going to completely let you down or make your opponent feel terrible. Like, like that, that, that's the only two options on a five up, gen- generally speaking. Um, whereas the six is kind of just now icing, and the guys have just so many wounds, and they have an ability to heal it at the start of every turn. Um, yeah, it hurts them, but again, I just, it's just that whole thing, it just makes them a lot less oppressive. But they're still crazy good, and they're still just destroying everything they charge into. Yeah. Have which uh, which accursed gifts do you end up using? I know most people I've we've talked to or heard from. I feel like they use Sinewd quite a bit, which is ignoring modifiers, weapon skill, and getting brutal just to make sure that all of your mutated models can get their damage in when they get into melee. But do you have any other favorites, or do you have any different combinations that you feel like people don't talk about too much? Yeah, sinew is great. Um, the ones I like is obviously is the one that gives you little jump wings. Uh, not true fly, but really significantly good movement, um, especially like on open, uh, whereas you usually use that. And then the plus one movement is usually very good too. Are you finding that you're giving the accursed gifts with your or your tactical ploy often, or do you mostly just depend on your basic accursed gifts to give you winged, which is free traver or one cheaper traversal and then ignoring modifiers to movement or and fleet like because i know obviously some models can get up to three accursed gifts so what combination and when do you generally use those ploys yeah i the ploys i definitely use on edge cases um so let's say like if like, like generally if i've gone brutal um and someone thinks i'm not in range because either i didn't give them fleet or wings um and then i can just be like well this guy has it now he's activating he has it now and now he can make that charge um which is always you know it is kind of a a gotcha movement but i think that's how it's supposed to be kind of like it's hard to you know what i'll usually say is when someone's like am i out of charge i'm like yes you're out of charge range but i do have an ability to put myself there and usually they're like okay and they kind of have to take the risk just because of the other things in the board state. Um, that's kind of the edge case when I use it. Generally, I'm using my um, my CP for more of the army wide ploys and the um, the one that lets me fight twice. Unleash the demon, where you can perform yeah. two fights and a free fight. Do you yeah. end up ever using that to do the cheaper mission action, or does that generally not matter just because? You know, you don't have enough AP because your guys, your mutants and your torments are too stupid to do mission actions properly. Yeah, I usually use that to let them fight. Usually what my general tactic is to get my mutant to charge at the end of turning point one um, and just lock up, don't even fight or fight if I know I can win or if I know, well, fight if I know I can't die. Um, big thing. And I know I probably won't kill my opponent because I don't want to, but if I could shave some points, I'll fight. Um, and then at the start of the next turn, mutate that guy into the <coughs> torment, finish off the guy he started in combat with, and go off and charge and fight someone else. Um, and that's usually very devastating to whoever I'm playing. Because now that guy is in your back lines. He's in your black back lines, and he's already killed two guys with very little damage done to him. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the old days of this edition release when custodians would end up in your backline far before anyone was ready to manage a model with that many, yeah. you know, attacks and wounds. So I, when people describe the torment plays, that's oftentimes what it sounds like. Sure. Do you find that uh, playing Colts has given you, uh, or what other teams have you played? Do you felt like had skills travel over to Colts? Because I'm just curious. <sighs> nothing <laughs> so um i mean my, my main teams i've played is uh you know i started out with warp coven uh which is completely different things uh, i've moved on to uh, void dancers again completely different um and you know i've done some legionary and i've done hero tech i had this is really my first real true horde team um i mean they just they're just crazy like because you don't care about the cults, the, the the cultists themselves too much, like they're only there to turn into mutants and then turn into um, torments and then maybe do some mission actions. Uh, the devotees, um, 
you can really just lose them and not really worry about it. Like, like I've done plays where we've talked about, you know, blast weapons and stuff. It's just like, well, if it only catches two or three guys and it's only devotees, I'm okay with that kind of thing. <laughs> like playing other teams with blast weapons. Whereas like with other teams, you're like, got to make sure no one can't get more than one guy. This is like, yeah, if I lose two or three cultists, it's not going to matter too much. Yeah. It sounds like it's almost baked into most cult players brains is like, I'm going to lose anywhere between two to four of these before things happen. But once things start happening, it snowballs out of control very quickly. Yes. And it sounds like your most of your snowballs are starting from the mutants and torments now, unlike before the patch where maybe the blessed blades can maybe get stuff going a little bit quicker. Yeah. Anything else you want to check in on Jason? Um, well, I guess my main question I think has been pretty thoroughly answered, but, um, have the has the balance changes really like impacted the way you've been playing? Yeah, like I said, not not too much. Um, you know, a little bit more cautious with my mutants. I won't throw them into combat as easily as I used to, um, just because of that crucial link to your torments that you just don't want them to die. Whereas before, with the relentless, there was very low chance they were going to die in a combat. They were just going to, you know, I'll take a hit, maybe two. Um, and then the, the same thing with, you know, their reduction in, in their feel no pain, like you could take probably two, four damage hits and be fine. Um, so like that really plays in your map when you charged a lot of different things, uh, you know, stuff that had a good high damage, but now <clears throat> there's a good chance you'll eat, you'll die from two, four hit damages and you might not get any hits or very few hits. So a little more conservative with the mutant than would have been in the past. Have you? I assume you haven't had a game yet where an opponent was able to cut you off of torments almost entirely. I haven't. No, I'm usually pretty decent with my mutant placement where that's not happening. Yeah, very cagey on turn one, and then you go hard on turn two, and then catch back up on three and four depending on how turn two goes. Right. Yeah, sounds like still sounds like a very spooky team. Definitely more approachable now because now you can actually kill torments, which is nice. Whereas before on a five up feel no pain, if you gave them a four up save, they really could tank quite a bit of damage, right? Yeah. And then, like I said, they'll heal, they'll heal some damage back at the start of the turn if you really need them to. That's right. Because for listeners who don't know, you can use the mutation ability on top of already mutated models. And if they are torments, they heal D3 plus one wounds yeah. because that is part of mutation. There is an actual third line. Have you found that you actually use the D3 plus one quite often? Yeah. Uh, especially in the later turning points, like three and four, um, you know, cause usually by turning point four, most of the guys are going to mutate are dead. Like by turning point four, I find I have very few, if any cultists left, either they've been killed or they've been turned into other stuff. Um, or like if I have a lot of times I'll find three torments running around, um, that I don't need to mutate, you know, there's, I can't mutate any more of them. Um, I, I find I use that a lot, especially because sometimes that can really make the difference between injured and not on some of these guys. Um, it's just a really great, um, a really great thing to have in your pocket for sure. Because like, yeah, because I've been like turning point three and four. It's like you, you can you take three and then four guys. That's a lot. Um, generally, I find I don't have that many guys left on the field. Yeah, I think at this weekend at the Goonhammer Open, when I pass by, most of the time, by the time three and four rolled around, there was like three torments, and that was almost it on the board. But three torments is very dangerous still. Yeah, that's basically all you need, unless you're playing like loot or something. And I take it you're a Seek and Destroy Colts player and not an Infiltration Colts player? I am for sure for Seek and Destroy. I, I mean, that that's also for who I am. I like getting in there and smashing things. Uh, I find that's one of the most fun parts of the game which is why i like it. um so yeah absolutely I, I almost never do infiltrate have you run into any issues with any scoring any of your attack ops post post change or is it mostly play the same and the attack ops are still mostly straightforward yeah i think they're still mostly pretty straightforward um i don't think anything really changes that much for them i assume you're taking routes eliminate guards and then tear through you know, it's funny. I am. I know I'm in a small minority. I don't usually take tear tear through unless we're playing on maybe like the long ways. Um, because generally, I feel like I don't want to have to take my mutants and run them away from combat to score. I want them to be running in and killing stuff. 
So I'll usually take something like um, Executioner I like on it because I feel like the the torments can usually one torment can kill two guys, um, kind of things like that. I find are a little bit I prefer to play, and I know I'm in the minority for that. That a lot of people like tear through. Um, to me, if it's just a um, it feels like a win more tactic where if it's a close game. I'm, I probably want to take that guy, like, charge a dude on an objective and kill him and take that objective kind of So you're using Executioner on probably one of your later torments? Yeah. Or I guess you would you could even declare the Executioner on Mutant, like, early on and then, you know, have him pop out of right. cover on turn two. But Executioner is... You can score it per kill, right? So the Unleash the Demon actually works reasonably well with Executioner? I want to say... Or you have to call targets with Executioner. You have to call targets with it. Hmm. All right. Um, and I'm. I gotta check. I don't think you can do it twice in a turn. I yeah, see. you can't do it twice in a turn. You have to call targets. So you've got to like, pace yourself. Right. But like I said, you know, with, with the one torment, you can say, all right, he's going to kill the guy he started with. He's going to charge into two guys. Um, he'll kill one and just stay locked in the other one. And one of those two guys he kills was his target. Uh, so usually I can, you know. Executioner is definitely one you reveal when you have first turn, when you're going first in a round. Um, Because it almost guarantees you being able to pick it up. That's actually a good good note. I had not really thought about Executioner in that way. But being able to multi-charge with your 40 millimeter base at closer to the end of the turn or maybe middle of the turn and then locking up some models and then just saving your 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 target for the next turn. That's that's pretty juicy. Sounds like we're, you know, winding down on the Chaos Cults conversation. I, you mentioned earlier when we were talking that you play a lot of cult. You've been playing a lot of cults on the internet. Have you found any differences between online play and physical play that you feel like uh, maybe Chaos Cults on the internet has helped you in real life, or vice versa? Um, online play is a lot more precise um, because everything's a digital measuring. You lose that human factor. So when you're moving a guy around, um, you can see the measurement go up, going on right there. So there's no even, I mean, we're human, even, you know, the best of us will mess up like a fraction of an inch. This, there's no, there's no mistake. Same thing with ranges. Um, because you can pop out range, range rings around your guys, you know exactly um, who's in range and who's not. Again, you don't have that sometimes gray area we find. Um, and then same thing with like line of sight. There's tools for that too. So it definitely definitely makes you a much more precise player, which sometimes actually can be a little bit more difficult when you move back back and forth between the two mediums. Um, but like for me, like I'm I'm married, I have kids. It's hard for me to get out to a lot of tournaments. Um, it's great because I can get a lot of play and I can get my games in. Um, I can test a team before I make it, which is really awesome. Um, and there's just some great communities out there that um, you can really just just really get some really good good games in. I assume most of your games are on Command Point. Yeah, it's pretty much the only place I generally play. Yeah, that makes sense. Command Point sounds like a great place to be. And you know, I'm sure you want to talk about Nova a little bit before we tap out for the day. Yeah, um, it's looking like a, it's going to be a great event. Um, we're in a new venue. We're actually inside DC, uh, which will make travel for some people, I think, a little bit easier. Um, it's just massive. It gets bigger every year. Um, I think I put. I think I'm. I'm hopefully going to put on three really great kill team events, and I hope people enjoy it. Um, one thing that Nova always does is does a, a player survey at the end of the tournament. Um, I, at the end of the event, I really encourage people to do that. And if you're ever at an event, to fill it up. Um, I know I read those surveys um, and I have made adjustments to the way Nova has played. Um, one of which was getting rid of the casual pods and doing a narrative. The other is getting rid of player place terrain and doing more fixed terrain. Um, so really, those are really, I think that's a really good tool. And I really hope players will, if you're ever given that tool, definitely take advantage of it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to, for kill team, it's going to be the biggest Nova ever. Um, and I think we're going to be one of the, biggest tournaments in the u.s period um so i'm really really excited about that really really nervous um but i'm really excited about it and i hope i can i hope everyone has a great time yeah i'm looking forward to coming i'm sure jason is very jelly he can't make it that's true yeah 
looking forward to hearing all about it afterwards. Yeah, the week after, you know, I don't know if our podcast will have Nova content until the week after, just because of the way, you know, we record things. But we'll definitely we'll definitely be talking about it. Maybe we'll even find some other new TOs at Nova. Are you TOing by yourself, Matt? I am. That one's going to be a little spicy. It is. <laughs> I'm hoping it's not a mistake, but I think it'll be all right. Well, if you ever need a judge call and I'm not anyway, you know, I'm I can't really affect, you know, that person. You know, you can always feel free to ask because, yeah, sounds like a one for 70 is a that's a rough number. And, and, and I, I think I, I mean, generally, from my experience, the veteran players are very good about that. Um, I know for me, when I'm playing in a tournament, if there's a question on the table next to me, I'm always happy to answer it. And I think most most of the veteran players are. So I think that's definitely going to help. Yeah, definitely in agreement there. We'll have. Lots of the East Coast best players at this tournament. So looking forward to seeing how that goes. Yeah. Sweet. Well, thanks for coming on. I think we've pretty much covered everything that we're going to chat about here. Um, and thank you listeners for listening. And you've made it all the way till the end. So congratulations. Don't forget our spo- about our sponsor, Luster's Workshop. If you want to get a Just Another Kill Team podcast gauge. Oh, and, and they're, uh, we're doing their um, hobby track. Lustry's Workshop Hobby Track at Nova. So definitely bring your hobby skills. Nice final little kicker there for everyone. I think Dakota will even be there in the flesh. He so will. if anyone's listening, you want to meet the uh, who's who's of Kill Team, come by. 